Thanks. Thank you. This is bizarre. Yeah. This is uh, by far the fanciest thing you and I have ever been asked to do together. And will ask be asked to do oh, together. Absolutely. Yeah, we've reached the peak. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just these things alone look more expensive than any set we've ever performed in front of. Yeah. Um, I like that none of the VIP people showed up. Oh, a whole empty <laughs> VIP row. It's nice. It's always good when the only row you can see due to the stage lights is completely empty. <laughs> Never a great feeling. Woo. All right, cool. So we should uh, start this. I'm happy to be, I was texting you today. It made me laugh. I realized you and I have not had an actual conversation about comedy or the things we do together since probably 2006. Yeah, it's been a while. And it made me realize we've done the Gethard Show for like seven years, and you and I have never once talked about it. About the Gethard Show? <laughs> about like why we do it or what the thought is behind it or like why we think it's worth doing it. Like we've never once discussed, like yeah. there was never a conversation that was like, hey, I want to do this show. I want you to be a part of it. Here's there what I'm was one. There was once. It was so brief. But it was so long ago. Yeah, you just 2009. were like. 2009. Yeah, it's just. And I remember that, con uh, do you, uh, the first conversation we had about the Gethard Show. It was how you wanted to do something monthly because you did that paintball yeah. show. Shot people with paintballs. It was like the, the paintball boss. joke, like a uh, bracket show. Mm hmm Like a like, tournament. Yeah. It was a show where if, people, if comedians weren't funny on stage, they would get shot with a paintball gun. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, and so then your idea was to do something monthly where it was like a theme and you could kind of push, uh, do weird shit and push the envelope more. And you're like, do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah. But I pitched you on a specific bit, which you did, which the first ever Gethard show was you showing a slideshow. I pitched that to you. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> Either way, the very first Gethard show, one of the central bits was Shannon showing a slideshow. Of my <laughs> shit. <laughs> of her bowel movements from the past seven days. Yeah, it was how I, it was like a, yeah. The bit was how, how, I, how I was feeling this week. Yeah, you went over like what you had eaten and then showed. My poop. Yeah. <laughs> this Jesus. is by far the strangest start to one of these, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Is there anyone in here, I do have a question, that has no idea who Chris or myself are? You can applaud because uh, we can't see you. <laughs> oh, that's amazing! Wow, I like that. That's that's a cool person. That's just yeah, like gonna what? go see something different that they have no idea what it is. Now I want to talk to that person. Yeah, what made you decide to come out tonight? Oh, I'm in timeout every week. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah, that's they did list this. Yeah, say this sounds like someone. Outside of our demographic. Yeah. <laughs> and I like that. It's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. That is very, very awesome. Well, welcome, sir. And there's, I heard more than one clap, but we'll just take that one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you and I started uh, 16 years ago at the UCB Theater when it was f uh, hard in its own way to get into classes yeah. and uh, became friends pretty early on and just like any friendship got mad at each other yeah yeah we started working together 16 years ago but then there was a weird like almost two years where we didn't really talk there was like a year where we like didn't talk yeah where there was actual bad feeling yeah and then it was we got real up. fucking mad at each other <laughs> And it was like creative differences. It was. Well, that was the thing. I yeah. would say from 2000 to 2004 at UCB, you were like the person who I sorted out my feelings. Because I was 20 years old. I actually took my first class next week. It's 16 years ago next week because I turned 36 tomorrow. And it was a week after my 20th birthday. And for years, you and I, we took all our classes together. We mm -hmm. like were in all these groups together, really like figured out my comedic philosophy bouncing it off of you and then yes there was and a then year we worked we, were we worked so together we worked together too early on a project i think we were also forced into we the, yes people saw us as this duo that was going to be really huge and we're, they asked us and to and you tricked me oh god why is this the first thing we're talking about because it's coming up <laughs> it's a conversation that we're having so they know our relationship yeah, so, yeah, we you were did a, trick we me. Were, well, no. Oh, you tricked me. Now I'm remembering. I didn't quite trick you. Yeah, it was right before 9/11 too. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. 
It was, uh, we were we were doing like a two person improv show and uh -huh. the AD at that time was like, I'm gonna push you guys hard as a duo. And that was Owen Burke. Owen Burke. And then he told me, you really need to write a sketch show, yeah. not an improv show. And I think I told you that he like. Wants us to do an improv show. No, it was Yes, I, you did. I told you that he said we had to do a sketch show. You you booked, this is what it was. <laughs> this is where we get, we get mad at each other because of the details. This is what made you not talk to me for a year. This wasn't what made me not talk to you for a year. This, <laughs> this led to, this led to. This was to, the beginning of a downward spiral. This was it, yeah. Because yeah. we booked a date. You're like, Owen gave us a date for an improv show. And I said, and I was like, awesome. And then agreed to it. And then like a week later, you're like, uh, it's actually a sketch show. Yeah. So you got me on an improv show and it says sketch show. And then I was like, okay. But then I did, uh, we bailed on that date because of 9-11. Is that true? It is true. Look at that. Because I worked at CBS, I worked at 60 Minutes too, so it was like news. So I worked at CBS News, so I was just looking at 9-11 footage. Yeah. And I was like, I can't do comedy right now. And then we I did was a too dead inside. We and did then the we sketch show, it was very bad. Yeah. Because that was 22nd stuff. Street that he tried to get yeah. us to do it at. Oh, right. And, and then we did, we did do, and then we did the sketch show. The old, it was originally at the old UCB. We did it at the new UCB. It didn't go well. We got bad notes. We didn't. You, we were very upset with each other. Uh -huh. I made you store all the props at your apartment in Queens, even though <laughs> I lived with my parents in New Jersey who had a basement. You were so mad at me about that. <laughs> So mad at me about we spent that. Spent a lot of money. We did. We spent hundreds. We never. I think we never decided. We never split. I, I'm not asking for money. Uh, <laughs> did I? We not, never. I. We never I, I honestly evenly? have never. I, I have no idea. I don't. I even think care. we stopped talking to we each just, other before that conversation yeah, even yeah. could happen. Before we put the receipts together and figured out who owed who what. Yeah, we were already. It was already yeah. cooked. We needed time apart. Yeah. But then there was a group you were on that I wound up coaching. And uh, that was kind of the rebirth of our friendship. Yeah. And then we were back on track. And then I, I, I really pushed for you to join the Friday night team on UCB that I was on. And then we started doing Gethard's show together. And I feel like we're back. I guess. <laughs> no, we are. <laughs> we definitely are. It is. It's different, though. It is different. The first four years of our friendship, we were inseparable. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, just going for it. Yeah. So just, point, point being for this conversation, there is no one who knows my journey through comedy better than you. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. I would say. Definitely. Um, what? Because um, then you, because you let, like UCB, you were also kind of like this, like a little bit of like a, a golden boy coming through. Oh, was I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It was like, oh, who's this kid? Who's this kid? Who's this kid? Well, there was a running thing back in the day because it was such a small community. It was like, because even you and I met because we took level one at the same time, but anybody who knows UCB now knows there's like, like thousands and thousands of students every year, but like when we took level one. Maybe a hundred. If that, there were only two yeah. level one classes that happened in that summer. So we all did, there was like 30 of us and we all knew each other. Mm -hmm. But there was a thing where if someone showed up and they were really young, they got put on a little bit. Like Gemberling was that before me. Aaron mm -hmm. Bergeron was that before me. Zach Woods was that after me. Yeah. And it, I did fill that slot of like the super young guy who everybody had their eye on. Yeah. But and I you also were, worked you, hard. Of course you did. Oh yeah, yeah. Golden Boy can, Golden Boy indicates that I had things handed to me. Well, I don't. Whatever. No, I didn't mean it that way. I meant that you were just this like, who's this new kid? And a lot of people were taking you under their wings. That's true. You had a lot, like not just one person. I had multiple. You had yes. multiple people. You had you were multi you were multiple wings, covering you. <laughs> this sounds angry. <laughs> no. It's By not. a round of applause, who doesn't feel some bitterness? How is round it Round of angry? applause. Does this sound bitter to I, anyone else? What? It sounds like you're mad. It sounds I'm like you've got mad. these feelings about things from 16 years ago that I'm I never not knew. Mad. My, I hear my wife distinctly laughing at us breaking oh, down into a fight man. before we even really talk about anything. I'm very happy with where I am yeah. in my, in but my life. But people looked out for both of us, I feel like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. It, and it's very, uh, it's very, I would say like now it's at UCB, it's very easy to get um, lost. Um, and I would say back then, it was very hard not to be seen. Yeah. So like everyone saw, like everyone like, yeah. There was no auditions. They're just like based on conversations of teachers. Of yeah. Like this person's good. Put him on a team. And that's all it took. Yeah. So like everyone was watching you. 
Yeah, well, so I it felt, felt that. it almost like felt like more. Yeah, it almost felt like uh, that first year or so. I knew, but that was also amazing for me because it's so funny because that was two thousand, and I, it's having like thinking about the fact that this conversation was coming the past few weeks. I've really been thinking about a lot of this stuff, and it's weird because you knew me then well enough to know. Like I think it's very true. I think the years of two thousand to two thousand four were the best years of my life, because I found UCB. And it was this like valid, I was a kid who I went to state school because I didn't think I was allowed to do this. And it was like this exciting thing where I found it and these older people were like, it doesn't matter that you're young and like mm -hmm. depressed and you wear, like I think about like, I see pictures of the outfits I would wear into this. I looked like a, like a psychopath. <laughs> like I, dre I, do, I was dressed crazy, I, had, I looked crazy. I was like a depressed college kid. Then I found UCB and it was like, oh, you're allowed to be a creative person. But simultaneously, you can vouch for me as my friend, 2000 to 2004, also the worst, scariest years of my life, health-wise. It was like the best era of my life and simultaneously the absolute darkest period of my life. Because of like your stress levels of, because you were still in college for I was how a, many of those? Well, I was a full-time student at Rutgers University. I was also coming to the city at least four times a week to do UCB stuff, and I had a full-time nine to five job, three days, not full-time, three days a week, nine to five at a magazine where I was the only employee. And they were all, it was just I like impossible. I, I think you're, this, you're doing the same thing now. <laughs> I do work myself You're like a the TV bone. show, you have a podcast. I am a You're probably writer. writing a book and I have no idea I, about I it. You I are, have, okay. I've been working on it. <laughs> I've been working on a book for like two years and I yeah. haven't told anybody, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you are- A workaholic. That, yeah, you're a workaholic. Like that is dad, That has yeah. never changed. But you are at a, at a place now where it's not, I think college and uh, just growing up is a stress on itself. Yeah. And now that you're like an adult. And I should have dropped out of college. But also to be fair, one of the things now is that I'm like, I see a therapist and I'm on medication and that goes a long way. Right. <laughs> Right. Like back then I was doing all that and I wasn't sleeping at all. Like I would routinely drive from Rutgers to UCB and like fall asleep behind the wheel because I just never slept. Like that was the stretch of my life. It was really bad. So it was, it was like it got dark. And like, your car was <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> your car's not like that now, right? No, no, no. Okay, I haven't been in like your car in a while. What, the old, my, car, old, my oh. old man car? That old 1986 Chevy Celebrity? Oh, the Nissan. Was I ever in the celebrity? I can't you were remember. In the celebrity. When we were on our first team together, I used to drive around in a 1986 Chevy Celebrity. Yeah, uh, and they're both they're both just like disgusting. Just filled with fucking fast food wrappers. Yeah, like you didn't know how to throw things out. <laughs> okay. Uh. <laughs> it is fair. We I, I, we did because you Shannon was in um, Tribeca. The, the premiere of your movie, mm -hmm. you asked me to go with you, and yeah. I was really flattered because the first movie I was ever in, you came to the premiere, and that meant a lot. That felt like a full circle moment for us. Yeah. But it really made me realize that you and I, we are not friends. You, it is a big sister, little brother thing. Moments like that where you're like, your car was fucking filthy, and then I'm just like. That is friendship, though. No, it's more than that to me. Because you also, when you get mad at me, I feel guiltier than when anyone else. That's on, <laughs> that's on you, though. No, but you also know that that's true. It's weird. This is weird. <laughs> Drink your water. This whole thing is weird. Um, now you keep saying 2000 to 2004. Yeah. Like that's like clearly a compartment of your brain. Yeah. So now what is, so then what is 2005? 2004, so here's, <laughs> no, it's true, because you all, well, no, you know, because you know me. Change the, yeah, you can adjust the question. No, 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 that's I'm fine. answering the question. I'm answering the question. Because, oh, now I lost my train of thought. So, you see it? Yeah, 2004. Oh, I always think you're mad at me. I'm not mad at you. I always think you are, though. I this know. is why we stopped having conversations about this stuff, because I always get stressed out. We're also having it in front of a strangers and a man who doesn't know who the fuck we are. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, so, to me, there were two aspects of life that changed in 2004. One was that I went on medication in 2002. And there were about two years later that was insanely hard, where I was having all these crazy side effects, where it was like I felt really scared and didn't really talk about it with anybody. It was like very, you know, when I first went to therapy, I think there was a very, very small circle of my friends who knew. There was also this embarrassing thing where I got put on, I got put on a mood stabilizer, an antidepressant, and an antipsychotic when I was 22 years old, and a muscle relaxer to help deal with the side effects that only gave me more side effects. And I would like have short-term memory loss, and I would have 
uh, all these physical things and I would, I would be like falling asleep in the middle of the day. Like, so there were about two years where that took, like A, where the physical stuff normalized and B, about two years in where I think I was comfortable enough to own it and just mm -hmm. say like, fuck it, I need people to know in my life that I'm on top of this, you know? Like this is, I can't, it was like weird to like feel better than I'd ever felt before and not talk openly about that. So I think by 2004, that happened. And then I also got my first job. And when I left uh, for Crossballs, I got hired right. as a writer's assistant on a job at Comedy Central out in LA. And it was like real short notice. None of us, there was no UCB theater in LA at that time. And barely anybody had moved out there in 2004. Yeah, and that was like the first, now people move to LA all the time. Yeah. But that was like the first, like it's like, at least for me where I was like, oh, I can lose my friends to LA. Yeah. I was the first. Um, I was the first one from our generation. But you did have plans on coming back. Yeah. So that made it easier for like I was like, oh, he's gonna, he can't. Yeah. He loves Jersey too much. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I'm obsessed with New Jersey. Yeah. But I thought of, it was weird because it was it was it, it was very interesting because when I was out there, I was out there for about four months, I think, mm -hmm. something like between four and six months, and I had been a very very volatile person emotionally my whole life, and I just left. Like we won't say who. But there was a girl who, in my younger days, when you first met me, it was. I look back and I'm like, oh, that was a very, very unhealthy relationship where that, I was pining for this girl. And I think she and I both have said like we were both real fucked up with that situation where I was like, I don't know which one you're talking no, about. No, you do. Oh, you know, you know the big <laughs> one. And like, I just like stopped talking to her and and like all these people from Rutgers who had been pretty negative, stopped talking to them. All these people, I stopped drinking. Um, around 2002, but like anybody who, basically anybody who had ever I drank with, I never talked to again after I moved to LA. And I went out there and all of a sudden I was like meeting new people and they just like liked me. And I was like, oh, there's this whole reset button where there's all these people that are just meeting me as this person who never had this bullshit to deal with. Whereas I think a lot of other people in my life um, like knew me from that. And you know, they, you know, I think it's totally fair. like. You'd been with me a few. You'd see, you. You're one of the few people left in my life who'd seen me get drunk, and I would get blackout drunk, and then other people would have to fucking deal with it. And even on the days where it's not like that, I think it causes some concern for people. People would see me get just like furiously angry for no reason, and uh, I think that puts people on edge when they don't know where your emotions are gonna go. And like, even at UCB, where I finally felt kind of like safe and accepted for the first time in my life. Those first four years, I think I was setting a tone where people maybe didn't know what to expect to me or were seeing some of those pitfalls. Then I went to LA, cleared my head even more, drove cross country for the first time, which I found out for me, like I've now driven cross country five times because just sometimes when I need to make big choices in life, I'll drive cross country to do it. And uh, yeah, it was like, I think- so That's I, like a warning, the next it, time I mean, You're going cross country. I, when I broke up with my longtime girlfriend, I drove cross country first, and she was like, I fucking knew you. I knew, as soon as you said you were driving cross country, I knew you were about to break up with me. <laughs> she knew it. She knew it, because it is. It's a life decision maker. Um, but yeah, so in LA, I met all these people, and I was like, oh, this is how people perceive me without all the baggage, and that helped me let the baggage go and just kind of move on from it. So that's what, that's what happened in 2005, was when I came back from LA, I was like, oh, I get it. I get mm -hmm. who I am now. I've kind of grown into my own skin. And anybody who can't get over the, what was happening to me when I was really descending into like some actual mental illness stuff, like if anybody else can't get over it, that's on them at this point. I'm gonna move on. And I think you would vouch for me. That's like, I, I think I just became like a, a remarkably more positive human being because yeah. of those experiences. And I think that positivity has really sort of affected my work moving forward ever since then too. S very slowly at first, but around 2009, the flood floodgates broke where I think it became a major priority for me to make my comedy um, sort of like, I'm o I've always allowed myself to have a chip on the shoulder. And I think the comedy that we do has like, you know, punk rock gets thrown around a lot on our set and in uh -huh. our writer's room and people roll their eyes at it sometime of like, stop talking about punk rock, but it has a little anger to it, but I think it also has overall like a priority on being like welcoming and really accepting of people and trying to like embrace fans and include fans and make them feel like they're part of a thing. 
And I think a lot of that, I think I, I realize now um, at the age of 36, as of tomorrow, like I think a lot of my comedy- Do you want people to say happy birthday? You no. keep saying- No, no, no. But I'm like saying birthday. 35, but in 12 hours, that's I not know. the case. So I feel weird about it. But it's like, <laughs> I feel like right now, I realize like a lot of my priority has been trying to make stuff for people who were as fucked up as I was until I wasn't that fucked up. You know, I think mm -hmm. I really feel that. So it's been a weird thing to realize, but- it's also part of why I think I've stayed underground. Um, but yeah, that's the very long answer to what changed in 2005 is I think I just managed to move past a lot of the shit that had been really wrecking my life. And then you're, you're saying, so we have 2000 to 2004. Uh-huh. Then 2005. Yeah, to 2007. And that's the other, because. What's that? Here's a thing that, I, that you know about me is I've also been very good my whole life of like, constructing a, a mythology. I'm, I'm the first to admit, I mythologized my own journey. Uh-huh. And I like that you're now allowing me to baby step through that with a smirk on your face the whole time. Well, what is 2005 to 2007? 2005 to 2007 was when I wrote Weird New York, made a thing that was my own. Like oh, my boss right. is from Weird New Jersey, let me make my own thing. And that was a cool thing to like see a thing I made exist with my own name on it. I also got really scared because I got in a fight with my shrink and uh, went off my meds and was pretty good for a few years. But then in 2007, I got hired to guest write for, two th for SNL. That was for two weeks. So I'm like working the com comedy dream job. And I did well there, they liked me. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna submit this summer and I'm gonna get this job. And I didn't get it. And then I wound up having a really, really bad mental collapse because of that. Not and you were totally not, because of that. And you were not on meds at that time? I was time? not on meds at the time. And it, I looked back and realized, oh, I was doing okay, having some ups and downs off meds. But looking back, I was just, it was just a matter of time before the bottom fell out. And there was a lot of shit going on. But the SNL thing, in particular, the UCB SNL show during the writer's strike, I don't know if I've even told you that story. That led to a big, that was like the flashpoint for a big mental collapse that was kind of another reset point in my life. That was where- The show? The, uh, well, I, so I had guest written, this, this kind of tells you like, it's weird, it's weird because like almost no one knows who we are. That guy in the back has never heard of me. And like, it's, it's a funny thing because it's like, if he's even still here. And uh, <laughs> it's weird because yeah. it's like, we've been working for 16 years and it's like, and I feel like right now I'm at the most awareness uh, I've ever had of who I am in the comedy world, but still, like if I got something on a TV show or movie that was mainstream and killed it, I'd be, people would be like, this guy came out of nowhere. And it's like, well, I've been working for 16 years to make it happen, so it's very That's strange. That's for everybody. For everybody, yeah. for everybody. But it just, it's like goes to show there's like so many lows, there's so many highs that feel like the most important thing that's ever happened. Like guest writing at SNL for two weeks felt like this acceptance into a club and that was the biggest thing that could ever happen. And you know, everybody's patting you on the back and the ego is like being stroked, feels good. And then a few months later, they chose not to hire me, which totally makes sense. I've never, I'm never, I've never been a sketch writer, but I did really well. I was like, oh, they're gonna hire me. They liked me, I'm gonna be part of the club. And then the writer strike happened mm -hmm. and they did a live show at UCB, which like UCB, that was my home. Like that's my turf, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I helped run the place. I was like running the school, writing the curriculums, all this shit. And uh, they had the writer strike, and all the show, all the comedy shows in town were doing shows at UCB during the writer strike. And uh, SNL did a live show there, and I was uh, there was like a big thing of like all the performers have to wait in line uh -huh. to get in. And I was like, hey, is there any way since I went through this experience that maybe I could just kind of like sneak in? I would be a little like my ego would get fucked with me. Like, nope, wait in line, and it killed me. I felt like man, my home has like told me kind of like shut up and sit down and uh, went there that night and just had a real, real, real bad panic attack. You were not, I can't, you, you know, you have to feel the feelings you felt, but there were it was a lot of people that were told. It was all ego. It was like so yeah. many times. That was life. a big test of ego. It was huge. Because there's a lot of people that were yeah. getting and mad at. Yep, a ton of people. And it was just, what I've learned over and over again is I've had so many experiences that have just hammered ego out of me. And I look at who I was and every, I feel like every passing year of my career, Things, every time things have gone well, it's when I've been at a place that feels very like zen and very ego-free, and that's when shit comes to me. So I've just tried to extend that as much as possible. So 2007, I got back on meds, and I would say 2007 till now is the current era of my life. Oh, it's a big chunk. Big chunk. That's yeah. the Geffen Show era. That's that the is Geffen true. Show era, yeah. 
because 2007, <clears throat> I started with Barb, my shrink. Big ups to Barb. <laughs> Shout out, Barb. Big ups to Barb. She put me on a drug cocktail that really worked. She has my back. She's, uh, she's arguably crazier than I am. Um, but I really like her advice, and then I met Barb. I think you did. She came, came on the she very inappropriately tour. came on a tour of my life. I threw where people came on a bus to locations from my life, and there's a picture. There's a picture of all of us on my parents' front lawn. I did a storytelling show at UCB, and that was when the cult, uh, like the cult audience, started sort of coalescing around me. These kids who from NYU who all came, and they wanted to see all the places in Jersey where it happened. So we rented a bus. We went to all these places at Rutgers and my hometown. <laughs> And I would just tell the stories from the storytelling show in the places where they happened. And there's a picture of all of us on my parents' front lawn. We, it ended at my parents' house without me telling my parents I was bringing <laughs> 70 people to their house. This was also the first Gethard Show-esque event that led to all the weird shit we do. Was that during Gethard Show or before No, Gethard that was the show? precursor. That was the first thing I did that was like kind of out of the box that the press wrote about. Time Out New York wrote an article about like this guy is doing this weird shit and he just did this bus thing. And that was the first, I started right. getting calls from LA, like my agent, the first time I signed with an agent, they were like, you're doing weird shit and we kind of want to have it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, there's this picture of all of us on my parents' front lawn and like you go through and it's all these like hipster UCB fans and then there's one woman in her 60s <laughs> who's just so clearly my shrink. <laughs> <laughs> and then she really pushed me hard to like go all in because I'd never gone all in on the career stuff. And like you said, from early on, a lot of people were protecting me. And I think I maybe got too safe because of that, felt mm -hmm. a little too protected at UCB. And I kind of had to spread my wa wings and kind of first kind of started pursuing stand up more heavily while still doing UCB because stand up is a much scarier, harder world. And then eventually, for a variety of reasons, UCB kind of phased out. Uh, and it's always going to be my home, and I'm always going to be someone who's like hugely thankful and a huge proponent of UCB. But I think I needed to just like I just think I felt too safe there, and uh, now I'm like focused mostly on stand up as far as performing goes. And, and uh, while doing that the whole time, Gethard Show just became a thing. Public access was such a crazy thing for us, and that brings us to today. Yeah, you're at 92Y. Weird. That's the background. Um, what do you think? I mean, the Gethard show is. Do you th do you th is it gonna end? <laughs> it could. I mean, right? but it, it's so the Gethard show. Like, what age do we all get to? I don't know. It's been pretty fun seeing. It almost feels like everyone involved in the Gethard show, me and you included, feels like we're all collectively calling a bluff over and over again. You know, like it feels like constantly. Every, every smart play, every indicator of what the smart move is, is like, stop doing this show. And all of us are kind of like, hey, no thanks. And then oh, we just yeah, keep doing it. It's very fun. Out. Yeah, I don't know. So I wanted to end it at UCB and somebody talked to me and was like, uh, no, you, you, have you thought about making it a public access show? Uh, Keith Bethes, a guy who I taught in classes at UCB, <clears throat> was like, I work at public access, do it there. And I was like, that sounds hilarious, let's do it. And then public access was such a, like, it's so exciting. Like, by far, I look back and realize the most artistically rewarding section stretch of my whole life. Never been in an environment that was that insane, but that I could squeeze so much out of. And this people found it. We started getting calls from fucking Sweden and Brazil and all this stuff. Yeah. And it was so nuts. And so many times, though, where I was like, what are we doing a public access show for? Why am I putting my name on this embarrassing thing? And over and over again, people would be like, you got to keep it going. Like, fans would tell me, like, oh, like, I met my wife through this show. Or people would say, like, I quit this job I hated because of your show. And I was like, we can't stop doing it. Your show definitely gave, it also, like, the UCB show was very popular, but it was very much, like, in New York City popular. Yeah. Um, and you can only do so much on, like, Twitter. I don't even know if Twitter, I don't know when Twitter exists or whatever. But, like, yeah. you're the public access show, now it opened it up to, like, giving you, giving you access to more people more people access to you. It was crazy. And that's where you, correct me if I'm wrong, like that's where you really started to talk because people would ask questions. Uh, but they would hear that you or were open about like your mental health yeah. and they would start to ask questions. Yeah. And then just through like Tumblr and the way you can contact people anonymously, I would say that's another place, and I don't know if you still do it now, but you used to answer like all, almost all the emails or something, right? Or Tumblr posts? We or Everything, everything. The Do you still shows. do that now? 
not no like uh, they had to make me stop but it was yeah. crazy like when we started the show i was so dedicated to it and i wanted it to survive so bad that like if you sent a message on any social networking platform i answered it personally if you asked for a ticket i was the one who wrote you back personally and i was like i'm so excited you want to come i'll see you there sincerely geth if you ordered a t-shirt from the show it had my actual home address as the return address on it <laughs> I just went all in on this idea of like, there's a real, I've always felt like a very, very lonely, weird person. And uh, I started to realize this show, I'm finding all the other people who feel that way. And I have a chance to let them know that I'm willing to be a guy who we can like, you no know, rally around this thing, like you're not wrong. And I think back to it and it is crazy that I put my home address yeah. <laughs> on every order. But I almost did that as like an artistic choice of like these people are going to know. Like I can say it now because I don't live there anymore, but they'll see 724 Leonard Street, apartment 1B. Someone lives there now, though. Yeah, mail them shit. Don't mail go. them shit. <laughs> okay. Mail them letters that are like, you used to live in Chris Gethard's house. And then <laughs> they'll write back and say, who is that? <laughs> but yeah, that was a very artistic move. Like even Keith Haskell, who now, there's a guy named on our show who he showed up at our show dressing as a banana in the audience. And then I heard he worked in TV and I was like, come work on our show. Now he's one of the main producers, like the mm -hmm. second in command producer of our show is the guy who showed up at the public access studio dressed as a fucking banana. <laughs> he helps run our whole show. And he told me the thing that got him hooked was the first time he asked for a ticket, I wrote him back and I was like, dude, I'm psyched you're coming. Here's where it is. Here's what time it is. Like, I'm really psyched that you would want to come. Yeah. And he was like, I started asking for tickets just to see if you would keep doing that. And he was like, it was really weird, but yeah, it was like this community started gathering. But now when it got to a point that you could no longer connect almost as directly with the fans, yeah. does that like break your heart? It does a little bit. It does a little bit. Cause only because I think about it from their perspective. Because I always think about like artists that... Because, again, like, punk rock was such a huge thing for me. And I always remember there's this band that I was only into for, like, a year or so. H2O. They were, like, a hardcore band from New York. This band, I don't know if anybody here knows H2O. <laughs> melodic hardcore band. Wow. Wow, that guy in the back that claps. Guy, yeah. <laughs> guy in the back. He knows um, about them. But I'll never forget, I, like, went and saw them in Randolph, New Jersey. And it was, uh, big ups for Randolph. <laughs> <laughs> Route 10 in the house. But I went and saw them. I think it was in some old, weird, abandoned roller skating rink, if I remember right. And this was, I would look back, I was a senior in high school, and like, I was dealing with the depression stuff hardcore, and I was just standing in the back, kind of looking at the ground, and like, didn't know what was wrong with me, but I knew something was up. And the lead singer, Toby, from H2O, and this was like a big band in that stretch, the guy saw me in the back of the room before they played, standing totally by myself, came up to me, and he was, he, I was standing by these video games, and he was like, oh, these aren't turned on, huh? I was like, no, I don't think so, man. And he was like, yeah, that sucks. Like, dude, you doing all right? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I'm, th I'm psyched to see your band. Like, you, I'm sure you got other stuff to do. He's like, yeah, I, I should. There's other stuff I want to do, but I just saw you back here, man. I wanted to let you know. Like, it's cool that you're here. I'm glad you're here. And that I never, ever forgot that, that this guy who was an artist that I looked up to, who had, like, a small thing, like went out of his way to seek me out individually because he just saw that I needed it. Um, so it does break my heart that the Gethard show has gotten to a point where it is kind of, it's just too big. Like I, it hit a point where JD, who runs our show, mm -hmm. had to talk to me and he had to say like, you, your job is to be funny, man. Your job is not to try to save all these kids. Like it can't be because I was spending all my time doing that. It was like a becoming like thing. I think we're out for hours every day. I was answering emails and Facebook messages and now I get them and sometimes I can answer and then sometimes I just have to like tell myself I can't answer these because if I answer this one, I'm going to feel obligated to answer all of them. But I read every single one. Everybody who's ever sent me an email or Facebook about if they're not feeling good, I read every single one because to me it's just a reminder of like why I do what I do. And it's also a reminder of like because there is, there is a part of me that also knows that it's not arrogance to say I could have cut and run on this a long time ago and I would have a better career by objective standards. I think you would agree with that. Mm -hmm. There's probably a point, there's a number of points at which I could have cut the cord from the Gethard show, gone to LA, done pilot season, and it's never a sure thing. And maybe this is just me being like, wanting, maybe there's a part of me that's scared to go for it. But I do think if I went out there and went for it, I have enough friends and enough talent, I think I would have made it happen. But I, it hit a certain point where I was like, 
uh, like talking to sad kids on the internet feels to me like it will have more meaning long term than getting a fucking sitcom job when I don't particularly like sitcoms. So the longer I can keep this going, the longer I can find reasons to keep this going, I think the happier it's gonna make me long term, even if it means that I don't have as much money or as much um, you know, fame or even respect in the industry as I think I could have had if I went a different way. But if it means like, like I remember I was in Denver, I did a, a stand-up show in Denver right before Christmas and this kid comes up this to year? me. This year? This past year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> this kid came out after the show. People were waiting to talk to me. It's funny. Going, like, go, becoming a you know, stand-up, you work hard enough to get to a level where you can go on the road. That's like a thing you aspire to. And my first foray into the road, I opened for Berbiglia, Mike Berbiglia, for a year. And he told me very quickly, he was like, dude, whenever we're shaking hands after the show, he's like, I can tell the Gethard Show get fans from a mile away. <laughs> And he goes, they're literally, he's like, they're broken people. <laughs> he's like, your fans, I can just tell, they like can't make eye contact. They stare at the floor when they talk to you. Like, it's just you and them, just your whole conversation. Let's say they're just temporarily bent. Well, listen, <clears throat> he's like, most of your conversations with Gethard Show fans are just you and them just apologizing to each other <laughs> for nothing. He's like, it's so weird. And then, no, I, this, I'm not kidding, the next night, and I'm not disparaging this guy. This guy was super cool, fun to talk to, nice guy. The only Gethard Show fan who came up to me at the show the next night had one arm. And Burbiglia was like, they're actually fit, like this guy physically is actually suffering. Like they're actually broken. <laughs> like it's, it was nuts. It was like, yeah, th it is. It's like, it's people who need it emotionally, physically sometimes. But this guy right before December, uh, it was like December 20th or something. I had this show in Denver and he was waiting for me. He's kind of like looking at me and I was like, oh yeah, that's a Gethard Show kid. <laughs> And uh, I shuffled him to the front of the line as this kid, Justin. And he was like, dude, I just want you to know, like, your show, I found it um, during some, like, really rough times in my life, and it really helped get me through, which we get a lot. Like, mm -hmm. we get a lot. You're not, you actively like to let the fans be the fans a little bit more, but I think you still I, I don't have the ability. It's not your thing. It's not my thing. No, you I come in, you I make the jokes, appreciate, you go home. Uh, yeah. But you know. I have a whole two theaters full of people I yes. have to help. Uh, being artistic, I can't fucking right? help your people. Yeah. I gotta help my people. Yes, I will be the no, king. No, it's very draining. I don't have the stamina yeah. to, yeah. I'll be the king of the island of misfit toys. That yeah. will be my, I'll but this out. kid came up to me and he was like, uh, like really, he was like, it's just, uh, it was a rough time and your show, I found your show during this rough time and it was one of the things that helped get me through it. And we get that a lot. And then the kid, maybe two weeks after that, he passed away. Um, started seeing all our fans like because all our fans know each other online like they're not, they don't know each other in real life but a lot of these kids are, are people who maybe don't have the most friends in real life and they meet each other online and our show is a thing where um, sometimes people have met each other and realize like this is a person who I'm probably safe around and uh, the kid passed away and that killed me and he I, I, I dedicated two fans of our show passed away between season one and season two on fusion I dedicated the season to them in the monologue of the first episode this year but then the real thing that um, got me rambling about this was maybe a month or two ago, right before we started season two, I did a show in Pennsylvania, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And this girl came up to me named Megan. And she was like, I'm really, it's really nice to meet you. Like, I just moved to Pennsylvania. She's like, I don't know if you remember this kid named Justin, but he was my best friend. And I was like, I remember Justin really well. He was really nice in Denver. He was like, I'm, he was like, dude, I'm like trying to chase my dream, move to Colorado, want to work in the pot industry, I'm going for it. And I was like, that's <laughs> rad, man. Like, that's cool. That's cool, but he passed away. And then she was like, yeah, he was my best friend. He had some dark times. And like, I wanted to come and say hi. She's like, I like your show, but he loved your show. And like more, I wanted to say hi mostly because, uh, because of him, just letting you know that you did mean a lot to him. So to me, when I think about like, that's the type of thing that I know it's melodramatic, but it's like when I think about like, have I done the right thing? Have I put myself in the best position um, career-wise? It's like, yeah, I maybe could have cut and run and gone and done the LA thing that all of our friends are doing, but I think I'd rather like talk to Justin and Megan. Like I kinda, mm -hmm. I don't know. It might be arrogant to say, or it might be melodramatic to say, but it's kinda like that's, that's serving a better purpose than me being like, 
the creepy, like the, the fifth lead in an office who's like the creep, like, like the fifth lead on a sitcom where I'm like the creep in the office who's like pining for the fourth lead. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it just feels to me like even if only a handful of people ever hear of me, if the handful of people are as locked into it as that kid Justin and that girl Megan are, like to me that feels like it would be a shitty thing to do to them to stop doing it. So as to your question of will the Gethard show end, it's like I'm sure it will someday, but they'll kind of have to pry it away from my, my cold dead hands, you know? Yeah, now I, when you, with you saying that, it made me think how the public access uh, show was way more interactive with fans. Yeah. There was no screening. Yeah. None of that stuff. Yeah. Um, it was we live. Had, it, it was, was live, live, so live now. And we would have like celebrities on every now and then, but now we're starting to get like legit, yeah, big time celebs at points, yeah, very popular people. So uh, are you? N I I would say this is something that I would just say like that I worry about is that we're gonna get start getting fans that we don't want. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, like the cool like, kids now. Yeah, I don't want like douchebags and bros. Yeah. You know, like I'll take a couple bros. You want diversity? We'll take a couple bros. Hey. <laughs> but bros are bros probably bros are deep fine. down have problems. They probably have problems. I've gotten a couple sad emails from some bros. I'm yeah. Sure my dad. Yeah. Some sure. But it is like I yeah. Underneath I, the popped collar, I have real emotions. That uh -huh. type of thing, you know. Yeah. But that is like a, and I don't think that I've seen it yet, but you know, just like, based on all the the. Yeah. The bands keep yeah. keep us the band, grounded more because yeah. they're all the punk, indie, rock band. punk rock bands. We have the cool great. band. We have the best. I would say I'm not. I'm not. There's not many things our show is the best at. We have the best music booking though in late night. I'm convinced of it. There's yeah. Hi. How are you? Who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But yeah, I think to answer your question, I think the. I think to me the real thing has been. <laughs> Sorry, that woman. <laughs> brought us here. <laughs> <laughs> the, who she is is the woman who very kindly allowed us to do this. Yeah. That's who she is. <laughs> and I was doing a joke. But to answer your question, yeah, like to me, the, to me the main thing that I've always said is like, that I've always made an artistic point of really pushing is like, to me, I always want the fans of the show to always remember that I consider myself one of them way more than I consider myself one of the Hollywood people. Always, always, always. Because I just think that's true. And I've always felt that way. And uh, like I will always feel like a kid from New Jersey who does not, is not supposed to be in, in the entertainment industry. I'll never shake that, so I've tried to embrace it. And I always will feel more like the kids who are sad and watching it than the celebrities coming and doing it. So I artistically always try to make sure that I'm dragging the celebrities into our world mm -hmm. and not vice versa. And I think that a lot of the celebrities who have shined the most on our show since we went to Fusion are the people who show up and play ball, and who it's like clear, like oh, they get it. They, they don't get that reject this is it about the kids. Like Gerard part. Carmichael was just on yeah. and wore a helmet and let us shoot a tennis ball cannon at him that was shooting like <laughs> tennis balls at 80 miles an hour, and he had so much fun. And I was like, oh, our fans now, if they didn't already, they now love him because they realize that's a real dude. Jason Sudeikis last year, who I think a lot of people, Jason's the best. We know him from UCB, one of the funniest people in the world. But also, he's getting leading man roles, mm -hmm. and I think you see a leading man in movies you think of a certain way and you don't necessarily think like punk rock underground and then he comes on our show and the whole audience that night was dogs that was the premise of the show <laughs> and uh at some point he revealed he had no sense of smell and he was like i'll eat it if i ate a chimichanga over that bag of dog shit right now i wouldn't even smell it i could eat a whole chimichanga with my face in that and we were like great let's get a chimichanga he's like great and he just ate a chimichanga in a bag of dog shit and <laughs> And I know that's so dumb to say, but there's also a part of me, like I'm always thinking artistically, you know this. You've seen me get manic like this forever, but there's a part of me that's like, in a world where our show gets popular, if our show ever manages to bust out in a big way, what we can give people like Sudeikis is like the uh, people who crave underground shit now know, oh, that's a dude who has integrity and he's a for real, he's ready to get in the trenches and go for it. He's not worried about his image or his ego. He's ready to come in and play ball and like interact with this weird world and these weird kids. And that's why like when we have an audience full of dogs or when we do like a lot of the weird shit we do, to me it's like, it's never, like people always say our show is weird and I've said that, but I don't even think it's weird. To me what it's more important is like it's abnormal. And the difference there is that there's a normal world and then our world 
it pokes holes in that mm -hmm. and I think kind of calls out like I'm pretty angry when I watch regular late night TV I love a lot of shows I love Conan in particular I love Seth in particular a lot of shows I love Samantha B a lot of shows I love all of them I have respect for all of them I don't want to I don't want to be but you did about take a few out of what you're about to say well <laughs> but I will say like a lot of them are just sort of like I don't know generic bullshit uh, like you know like selling ads selling ads and also like clearly doing things because they're told they have to do them and also like this format that's so tired that nobody likes that they don't like they don't know these guys don't like saying these monologue jokes they all are like the daily show does that why do i still have to do that well you have to do it because carson did it so to me i'm like i do that abnormal shit because i'm like i want to just take I, you and i are both letter one of the early bonding things letterman we mm -hmm. were both obsessed with letterman yeah you told me you were a page there right or an uh, intern, intern there and i was so jealous you told yeah. me all the stories about it. <laughs> but to me, I feel like one of the things I'm trying to actively do, when you get past how weird our show is, and when you get past it all, when you try to think about the fact that I try to be a smart person who builds it, what I'm really trying to do is take everything that was like the weird, like the side of Letterman that would go to the Taco, Taco Bell drive through or the side of Conan that would take Mr. T apple picking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all those very weird, honest, raw things that frankly, I think are getting left behind a little bit now in late night. I'm trying to make our show all those things, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I'm not trying to make, I'm not trying to, I'm really not trying to take pot shots at anybody specific, but I don't need to do, I don't, I don't need any more nostalgia driven late night in my life the past few years, I don't need, I don't need to relive the 90s through late night TV anymore. I don't need to see celebrities doing cute shit anymore. I need to see celebrities eating chimichangas over bags of dog shit to show that they have like a punk rock artist's heart. And that's the world I'm trying to build with The Gethard Show. What was the original question? <laughs> Kidding, oh. doesn't matter. Okay, great. That was me, yeah, worried about. See, one more. I was remembering. See, one more karaoke driven late night bit. I'm gonna fucking lose my mind. <laughs> I swear to God. I just called out what someone if, in specific. What if, what if, <laughs> what if the TCGS consulting producers. It's the karaoke bit? But, but it's really good. It's happened though. It's I know, happened, I know, though. you're it right. It happens where I'm like, I theoretically understand that that's so funny and will probably be more successful online than other shit that I wanna do instead. But that being said, fuck that, like <laughs> watered down shit is the enemy. And that comes down, cause when, when Juan, the team you were on mm -hmm. was formative for me as a coach. And I think formative for the people on that team. Yeah. Cause that team at UCB was legendary. And I think the thing that we came up with that really reconnected me and you are like, reminded you and I artistically that we were always gonna be like, even if we couldn't get along personally sometimes that we always needed artistically to stay on the same mm -hmm. page was like that team was the thing that reminded me like if you can't be the best be the worst like if it's not going to be the most brilliant show you ever do make it the biggest disaster because by middle trying what's that yeah by trying yes yeah. like don't go out there swing just to, big yeah and if you miss miss hard because if you land in the middle ground you're not a real artist it's bullshit go away yeah. and i want tv that doesn't aim i don't want to make tv that's just like well what's gonna make 18 to 24 year old males buy fucking deodorant i don't care <laughs> maybe that's why you smell <laughs> <laughs> no maybe that's why a lot of people you know were a little put off by the show or scared of it in pitch meetings i even had one of the biggest networks one of the big five one of the development people came to a taping of the show on public access attended sat me down afterwards. I had a meeting with her in LA months before and then we got lunch the day after. She's like, I fucking love your show. It's the coolest show. It's like awesome. It's underground. I love it. And I was like, oh my God. And she's like, want to be clear. If I picked it up, I'd have to ruin it and I don't want to be the one who ruins it. So I actually really appreciate that. That was more forthright and honest than many of those meetings mm -hmm. went. Big five and a woman, figure it out. <laughs> Probably not hard. Circa 2012, 2013. <laughs> You're giving more information. Yeah. All right, we got some questions. I'll, I'll answer. Let's just do this one. Yeah. Uh, this is a pretty common one, but I think this is a good one. What advice do you have for new improvisers? The advice I have for new improvisers is, um, I assume specific, if you're asking this question in New York City, I assume you live here and, uh, and, and it applies specifically to New York. The main thing I would say is do it for the sake of doing it, chase the art for the sake of chasing the art, and that one of the major differences between when you and I started and now 
is that many, many, many people come out of the improv scene and are successful. That mm -hmm. was the thing, you and I didn't have that pressure on us. We weren't chasing brass rings yet. The brass rings came along when you and I were three, four, five years yeah. in. I was really just having fun mm -hmm. um, and letting it be like a cool creative outlet. Yes. And now it is, yeah, like I had said earlier, so many people have now their eye move. on the prize before they even sign up. Yeah. And it, you race that bullshit from your it. mind. Like race people it. show up now trying to get on SNL, trying to get writing jobs on the Daily Show, trying to do all these things just because other people <clears throat> from the improv world have done them. But the two best things you're gonna get out of uh, improv are you're gonna sharpen your own skills, which at the end of the day is the only thing you actually have that you can actually rely on is your skills. And you're gonna find your tribe. You're gonna find the other like-minded people who will mm -hmm. get your back. Like the Gethard show for me, like I spent years at UCB doing things a certain way, finding people like Shannon, finding people like Zach Woods, finding people like Bobby, who I was like, we're on the same page somehow. And that started opening the door and attracting the other people where it was like, oh, I'm doing things in a different way. I found my tribe, you know? And then public access, they kept finding us. You can, you sharpen your own skills, you find the other like-minded people, and then you'll either get into that system that puts you closer to the success you want, or you'll have the ability between having a crew and knowing you're good to build your own thing. Um, so put yourself in a position to get as good as you can where if the traditional means don't work out, you know you have your, you know, you have your arsenal of weapons and that's what you focused on building so you can go do it your own way even if the, the, uh, cause UCB at this point is, is, is it's, yeah, the it's, top dog. Yeah. It's an institution and we helped build it. We helped, me and you, yeah. I, I helped build that school into being what it is. But that being said, it can offer a path and not everybody gets to walk that path but the most important thing is if the people you meet, it's the people, people you, meet. you meet. And if you go in saying, I'm going to get on a team and then that's going to get me an agent. And you're not going to be fun to writing, work with. You're not going to get funny. So go in and get funny. Yeah. Don't worry about any of the other bullshit. And when the other people who do worry about that bullshit get annoying, ignore them. <laughs> yeah. Be my main thing. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, do you think your comedy changed once your mental Illness, is that the right way of saying it, mental illness? Apparently, I've been told that people like to say mental health let's, issues let's, let's, because mental illness sounds like a thing where you're fucked up, where yeah. mental health sounds like a thing where you work on your physical health, why won't you work on your mental health? Then let me say this question sure. over again. Do you think your comedy changed once your mental health was adequately treated? It did, in a big way, and it got better, which I was surprised about. Because I, for many, many years, thought that the fact that I was fucked up was part of why I was funny and why people were interested in me. And that was like very, very, um, very, very much validating unhealthy behavior and unhealthy shit. And Shannon, we, you were made fun of me on the show the other week. I used to, when I would improvise, I'd always be like watching shows and be like this. Mm -hmm. And people thought, we're like, that kid's so focused. And really, no, I was being sent every show, the adrenaline rush would send me into a manic fit. And uh, then when I got medicated, that's when my career started coming together because how I'm like the best organizer now. I never would have been able to like send emails and build schedules and like organize other people's logistics. Hey, everybody's meeting at this place at this time and da 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 da. So that getting my mental health shit together made me uh, just much better as a comedian as far as someone who can like treat it like a professional. And then also artistically, I think it just made me much more empathetic and less self-focused. Um, which is why, as things have come up with the show and people kind of, like people kind of looking at me as like a mental health advocate, which I did not intend, I think it made me empathetic enough to deal with that and it made me focused enough to know what those people needed and it kind of merged with my artistry. Because that could become overwhelming. Totally overwhelming. Yeah. The most overwhelming being the Tumblr thing that you mentioned a little bit before. Oh, oh, um, you would, um Right, that was one of the early things of you answering so many questions and then you put you publicly yeah. put one on because someone was, was point. Yeah. someone had emailed about uh, asking you if you had suicidal thoughts. Yes, a fan asked me if I had ever had suicidal thoughts and it was anonymous on Tumblr. Um, so I wrote back a very public response. It was like 7,000 words long. I tried rereading it today it's long. and I had to take a nap. Yeah, <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> I'm making a joke, no. but I did. I read. I. I. I, I, really I did long. it. I literally did it in two parts because it's pretty. Because it's so intense. It's really long, and I it's really couldn't. Intense. I. I forgot about uh, yeah. a lot of it. Yeah, 
and I just basically read it, and it's just, when I read it that morning, it's weird, I reread it, and the question now, I'm like, I wonder how casual it was, but when I read it that morning, something about it just felt really real. Felt like this person had sent a very real message saying that he or she felt um, suicidal. And I was just like, I just don't think it would be responsible to ignore this. So I poured my heart out into this response. And that, that I had talked about that stuff on stage and even in our show a little bit beforehand, but that was what kind of made it hit this tipping point that it was like, well, now you're, now you're a guy who talks about this. Mm -hmm. Which was very, uh, not totally intentional, but a mantle that I was happy to take on because it has, um, a lot of people have said it has helped them, so that's good. Yeah, no, I think it, it was uh, a great thing. You know, I do have a question Yeah. that that made me think of, because as I was rereading it today, those were um, a lot of the stuff that you brought up were all things I was very familiar with. And there's like a lot of stuff that you're, this might be something that you can say no to, but you are very public about like the um, points in your life where you, you start to kind of like fall back out, like yeah. your mental health takes a dip. Has there been anything since, um, I'll just say like in the past year, like a moment that you, or like year and a half? Yeah. Since, how about this, since you, since you met Hallie? Since I met Hallie? Yeah. Hallie Your wife. My wife for anyone yeah. who. Because I feel like a lot of stuff is pre-Hallie. Yeah, it is. And so like 12 was the last, that's when I fell off the wagon at Bonnaroo. Yeah. That was the last real big one. So baby, basically that MD 12. MDMA, hell of a drugs pull. Yeah, I know. I've, I've, I've done it. It's fun. <laughs> but just I did it once. Yeah. And it was a blast. And I, I haven't did, done it again because I don't want to not have a good time. It was so crazy. I did it in I'm 2012. I'm not promoting drugs, but. I did it in 2012 and then did it exactly the same way I did alcohol, which as you know. Too hard. You were with me much. on one, that, you, with that one night. That was one of the worst nights of my life. You I was with you on one of your nights. I know, one, I know. That one yeah. night drinking. Like, you're one of the people who can vouch. You should never drink. You just shouldn't. Um, Most of us shouldn't. Yeah. But has there been anything, then I guess since, yeah, like 2013 um, till now. So it's like the past three years. Yeah. I mean, I've had stuff where I get really down. How I can vouch for me, there's some days where I just wake up and I'm like, yep, I'm sad. It was one of the like things, getting married, I think one of the things that Hallie had to deal with was realizing like some days there's going to be days where I wake up and I'm really just sad and she's going to ask why and I'm going to say I don't know and I think she had to learn how to like just not not be overly concerned and just understand that mm -hmm. that was part of my life but I'm very happy to say that like partially I think because uh, I think like mostly because of her I just have a much stronger foundation in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had been, you know, you find the person you're supposed to be with and it's like part of that is I think it's just such a source of strength. She's such a sor source of strength. But then I think also there is an element of, I think what, I'd, what I've learned in the past handful of years with my mental health stuff is like I'm not getting better. Like it's not, I always sort of thought like, oh, someday you conquer it and then you can go back off the pills and that's like a source of pride. And what I found is every time I try to go off the pills, like eight months later, I'm curled up in the fetal position and like trying to find a new shrink. So to me, I realized like this is like, this is not, uh, it's not the flu, you know, it's diabetes. It's mm -hmm. like a thing that you just deal with all day. Treat it and you feel, and then there's yeah. just some days that. Some days are much worse than others, but yeah. the really good thing is I think once I came to grips with that, which again ties back into our ego thing, because it's ego to think I can conquer it and move on with my life, that's my ego. And I always try to chase the ego out now. Once I realized this is just a thing that's always gonna be a part of me, what I found was the good stretches last exponentially longer and the bad sections are much, much shorter and they don't have massive repercussions anymore. And one of the big developments the past three or four years of my life is that like I'm much better about, like I remember with the Gethard show, JD and Noah and Drew who were kind of, they were kind of like the inner circle of people who would help come up with the shows on public access, it would hit a point where on Wednesdays, sometimes I would just text them and be like, hey guys, like, I'm super depressed, so tonight, um, show's probably gonna be bad, I'll do my best. And they just got to a point where it was like, yeah, okay. And for me, that was, that was a major victory to realize, I can just tell people, mm -hmm. I'm off my game. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> deal with it. Um, but it was never true. There was never a bad. I would say there was never a bad show because you were, we never had a bad episode on public access. <laughs> Not. I would say we never had one because of however you were feeling. That, I, I would say that once true. that show starts, 
it automatically is its own drug yeah. in getting you excited. Yeah, it does. I, Even I, now, now more than uh, it always has been, because I love like hearing the theme song. But now the theme song of the Gether Show is like is to me like a fucking happy drug. Yeah. I love that theme song Hallie so much. Hallie wrote that. Hallie wrote that. Hallie's happy drug. Hallie's my foundation. <laughs> She was my strong foundation, that song. <laughs> it's such a good song. Um, all right. In what, uh, let me see. In what ways has stand-up changed your view of performance? How has stand-up changed my view of performance? I, I, I will say this. I, don't get me wrong. I love improv. I wouldn't be who I was without improv. Doing as much improv as I did built me into who I am, made me a better stand-up than I am. That being said, I think what I realized with stand-up is um, it made me a better performer because I think one of the things that I hadn't had in my life previously was thick skin. Uh, stand-up gives you thick skin fast. And the thing about stand-up that changed everything for me was like, Improv, generally, when you do it, it's in a room that is safe for improv, where people are showing up because they know it's kind of like a stage that's dedicated to that. And being mm -hmm. someone who was a, a golden boy at UCB <laughs> from a young age, that was always a very, very safe space where I was allowed to do stuff and try what I wanted. And that has so many advantages, and I grew so much as an artist because I had that breathing room. But stand-up, sometimes you need to walk into a crowd that's like a whole bunch of tourists where English is not their first language, and you need to win them over. And on stand-up, sometimes you need to go to a club where the people are there because some asshole in Times Square made them buy $40 tickets and told them Tina Fey was gonna be there. This happened to me a few months ago. Were you at that show? I was at that show. Wow. Where a club, uh, where, where this, this crowd, a lot of the crowd had been told, oh, Tina Fey is performing tonight because some guy in Times Square was selling the tickets, just lying to them. She doesn't do stand-up. Those, those people are dumb for thinking that. Yeah, but then they show up and they paid $30 for the tickets and they get told, oh, you gotta buy two drinks. Also, the drinks are $12 each and now you're, you're like 60 bucks in and you brought your boyfriend, so now you're 120 bucks in and you're mad and you got tricked. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris Gethard. <laughs> like, that teaches you so much as a performer. And that's one thing, we had a, there was a big theater meeting at UCB a few years ago um, that I think Will Hines organized and he asked me to come back and just say a couple things. And one of the things I said was like, if you're an improviser, you need to get out in the real world. Because improv's not totally the real world of comedy. It's not 100% the real world. Stand-up could, could not be more of the real world. Like, there's Just getting outside of Getting UCB, outside of the safe space. Or, yeah, get outside of your home. And at the same time. Because improv on the road At the same time, hard. I say the same thing for stand-ups who never go into the alt rooms or who yeah. never go into, the, into Whiplash and the If You Build It and all the UCB shows. If you can't stand up, you have to work every type of crowd. And if you can't win over every type, like to me, the guys I always looked up to even when I wasn't doing stand-up, but it was like when I saw Mulaney and Kroll and Berbiglia, mm -hmm. those were the first people where I realized like, oh, like they'll come do a show with me at UCB and then they'll be like, oh, I gotta run up to Caroline's and then after that, I'm going out to some weird Brooklyn art space and then I'm coming back in to do the comedy cellar. And I'm like, oh, those guys, it's like all city. You know what I mean? Like they can go on any stage with, they can go up with like, aggressive Jersey hecklers, they can go up with tourists, they can go up with the artsy kids, they can go up with the college kids, they can do all of it. I wanna do that. And stand-up, I think, was a big piece of the puzzle for me with that. So that's what I learned from stand-up. Cool. Uh, who would you love to see as a guest on the Chris Gethard Show? Who would I love to see as a guest? Morrissey would big, be the big Ooh. one. <laughs> Now, would you let him perform, or is he too mainstream? I would let him perform. Okay. Because he's also What if he said no to him? Yeah. <laughs> if I was like, yeah, hey, no, we've, a we've asked him a number of times, and he has politely turned us, his people have politely turned us down a number of times. Morrissey, we reached out, I, I love it, our music bookers sometimes take big swings. They reached out to Springsteen. I always thought with the Jersey underdog shit, that would mm -hmm. be like the best. I always felt like if, if the boss showed up at our set, initially he'd be like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and then quickly he'd be like, oh, these are my people. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> like I always thought he would be, there was the Mountain Goats are a band that many, many people have said like would be, cause they're very, very hard on the sleeve lyrics and like a lot of like stuff about depression. And I don't, I don't wanna get into it cause I've kept it lock and key for a long time, but we had a very, very weird incident with the Man Mountain Goats management people that made that like a thing that was impossible, but I'd love to get them on there. Um, so those are the ones that jumped Those are all music. I know, which tells you how I regard 
The actual celebrity guest. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like celebrity driven things, and I think there's going to be a big but, backlash. But I'm just thinking of like, you got, we had John Starks. Yeah, that like was that's bad. what I'm saying. Like, what are those things like that? Doesn't to be like. I George tried to Clooney. get Rowdy Roddy Piper last year, and I got his phone number from Colt Cabana. I was texting Rowdy Roddy Piper, and he was like, "I'm down to come on the show." The fu fusion was like, you know, in the first season, we love to prioritize guests who maybe have a little more cultural cachet than professional wrestlers who are at their peak. Um, um, like the the peak of when they mattered was 1984. Like that's not <laughs> our ideal. And then he died. I was really sad. So I still want to get Ric Flair and Jake the Snake Roberts on <laughs> um, in the world of wrestling. I'd love to get uh, Patrick Ewing, but we've had Starks. Starks would be the pinnacle of the, of the Knicks big three. The thing that is being exposed right now is as far as like comedy celebrities. Like I'm like, I'm down to have them, happy right. to reach out. But I always think outside of that world. I always yeah. like to think back to the people who influenced me, influenced me as a child. And it's like, if Andy Kaufman's alive, he's welcome to come. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to have on Letterman and Howard Stern. I'd oh, I think yeah. of my heroes from when I was a kid, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. Um, Letterman would be rad. He'd hate our show. <laughs> Do you think? He'd make well, Conan because a lot. I, you Conan, know, Conan. I'd love. We've invited Conan to come on. I've been on his yeah. show a few times. Well, I think love Letterman Conan. might not. Uh, I don't like to assume how people will feel or react, but he is such a. Although he does like interacting with people, he might like it, but maybe, the, I don't know, will the audience be too close? Because the audience is like right here. Yeah. When but we're you know filming. what I'd love? I'd love to have Letterman. And even I out. sometimes, I'm like, <laughs> oh. move back an inch. Yeah, I know. I mean, there was a point in our show. Only because I worry about them getting hurt. Them getting hurt, but also public access. There was a point where the cult side of it got intense enough that JD was keeping a list of names of our fans where if I ever got killed, he was going to go to the cops with those names. <laughs> Did you know that? You should. It got really intense. Yeah. But you know what? I just watched Late Shift last night on HBO, and mm. uh, I always want to have Letterman and Conan on, because I feel like, uh, I don't know why I'm just being so, this is all being recorded. I don't know why I'm being so public. But I always feel like, man, like Letterman and Conan were the real deal, mm -hmm. and they both got fucked over hard. And I feel like our show is not popular, but m for me, I kind of feel like I'm always trying to like, I'm always trying to be like, well, they were the real deal shit, and I want to take like, the craziest parts of their real deal shit. Boil it down mm -hmm. to that vicious, vicious liquid, liquid, which was the name of our sketch our show. Because Amy and Poehler once taught a workshop we were both in and said, when improv is at its best, you're just like taking one comedic idea and squeezing all the juice out till it's this vicious liquid. And we yeah. were like, Amy Poehler's the coolest person in the <laughs> fucking world. Yeah. And, uh, but I always thought like, to, uh, to me, I'm like, let's take, let's take the chaos and anarchy that Letterman and Conan would do Let's take the cool remote pieces from Conan in particular. Let's take the like involving the real world from Letterman and let's attack the shit of it out of that. And part of that always to me, I always have this weird chip on my shoulder where I'm walking this fucking journey. And it's not true that any of this is happening, but I'm like in my heart, part of it is to try to make our show conquer the world to get revenge on behalf of Letterman and Conan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's part of my goal in my mind with the show that I'm doing on the Fusion Network that used to be on public. I'd but it's the internet, but, it's, but the internet. It is, but I mean, I'd internet. walk into the public access studio and that's what I would be thinking about before an episode. I'd be like, get revenge. Like th when Conan was dealing with all the late night shit, I was like, we need to fucking bust out so I can cut the throats of the people who did this to Conan. Like that's, <laughs> that's like the jersey in me. That is the yeah. jersey in me, yeah. And also, and yeah, it's positive and we include people, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's also giving, uh, uh, young comedians, like y people that are watching now, giving them comedy to be inspired by that is not boring or written just to sell ads. Like yes. I think about like when I first saw Wonder Shows in, yeah, and I was like, that stuff. If, if you've never seen Wonder Shows in, oh like get that. That's like that really went for it, and was like, I was like, what is this? Yeah. I can't believe this is on TV. And that's the stuff I love is like, I can't believe it's on TV because yeah. it shouldn't be, I can't believe this is on TV. It should just be like, put it, yeah. I realized that a few years ago. There's an like, audience. I, I started realizing that, um, like, someone said this to me of like, someone said your show is going to be like the Velvet Underground of comedy, where there was that thing said about the Velvet Underground of like, they weren't so popular in their time, but then every musician after them cited them as the thing that made them want to get started. There mm -hmm. was some quote like that. And it did make me realize at a certain point, like on public access, I was like, okay, when it was, cause you know, for years, before we left UCB, we were getting me meetings from people asking us to pitch a show. 
Um, and then for years on public access, networks would reach out and they'd flirt with it, then they'd bail. And like, there's a few people that I still kind of want to get revenge on uh, in my heart. I won't say who uh, this time. But give clues. <laughs> I no, I, know, I can't. I, know. I can't. Um, I'll get myself in trouble. But it made me realize, like, okay, I think our show is never. Maybe our show isn't going to take over the world. But we're gonna. We keep managing to survive. The cult is passionate, and that keeps like. I feel like one thing we had that I was smart about was I saw when, when like Arrested Development and Community, mm -hmm. and then when Conan got fucked over, Team Coco, they were these like internet driven fan bases that were like, no, you can't take these things away. And I kind of saw that and I was like, oh, our, our fan base is like, I want to build that before we get fucked over. Like, right. and I've actively thought that. I saw Team Coco and I was like, oh, Conan has an internet army rallying around him community has that arrested development had that i want to be the first show that's like hey like we are aware you're out there and we want you to be an army from the start don't yeah. wait till the crisis point and that was part the of army's why been so recruited oh yeah i was the general of the army <laughs> from the start um but i realized I, along the way like maybe we won't bust out in a mainstream way but i think what we will have is i bet 10 years from now there's a lot of people who said are going to say like they watched our show in middle school and they'll be making cool shit that's bigger than our shit ever was. And I'm pretty confident in that, in that. Especially like, I go, I do college shows now, and a lot of the kids who book me are kids who are like watching our show, and they're like funny, motivated kids. And I'm like, oh yeah, on college campuses we're big. And like, sometimes we'll get Skype calls from like a whole bunch of high school kids watching together. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, these kids are gonna grow up in a world where the internet is the norm, and where they know how to use that instead of me being in my 30s going like, how can Snapchat help? You know, like, <laughs> like they're gonna get it. They're gonna get it in ways I never got it. And they're gonna know how to attack better than I ever knew how to attack. And they might look, point at us and be like, no, these guys were building fucking belly burritos and that's why I got in the game, you know? Yeah. So that makes me really happy to think about. It's so easy now to just watch stuff. Like back in the day, like you missed a Letterman you had to have a VCR. Yeah. I mean, I recorded every single one, but like yeah. you can't, now it is so easy to also, people retroactively are like, I just found your show. It's crazy. And they can go back and be like, bi I think like I'm big on binge watching. Yeah. Like I can do like, oh, so I can like watch a season, but like, I don't know how people binge watch the Gethard oh, show. I, I'll get <laughs> Those public access years are like oh. fun to do. And I uh, and there are some yeah that were like early years. It's like well, what is this? And to be, I guess it's just like wanting to figure out what happens. I mean, like I'll See get gross from people who are like, I, I just found your show. I watched everything from from the first episode of Public Access through the Edna Fusion in, in the past week. And I'm like, there's over, I think there's like 220 hours of the Gether show on YouTube. 200. We've made 220 hours. That's crazy. We made 200 of hours of Public Access TV for no rewards, for no money, no hope, just to make it. Have you ever added up how much money you spent on public uh, access? Not, well, the first time I added it up, New York Magazine, one of the early things that like got word out oh, was New York Magazine wrote an article about us where they called me the Carson of cable access. It was like a real big thing for us. A lot mm -hmm. of people found our show through it. And the guy writing that article interviewed me and he asked me to add up um, how much I had spent and it was in the first year and uh, in the first year of the show on public access, and we went on to do over three more years, but in the first year, I had lost over $10,000 of my own money on a public access TV show, in the first year. You did the donation thing after, later that helped a little Afterwards, bit. Afterwards, yeah, we started yeah. taking donations and selling t-shirts, but the t-shirts, I'm such a bad businessman. There's that's, like some- And that's still man hours, so you're still losing I'm money. Still, and like my whole house <laughs> was overtaken by boxes and racks yeah. of t-shirts and envelopes. But I also am such a bad businessman and I'm so like, I want my fans to like, like I want them to know I'm never gonna take advantage of them. So there's some very basic formula that's like if you sell merchandise and you buy it for this much, you have to sell it for this much to make a profit. Right. And I was like, no, I'll sell it for like, I think I was like any t-shirt I buy, I'll sell it for $5 more then I bought the shirt for, never factoring in that it cost like close to $4 to ship it. <laughs> so I like, and then I felt too bad to ever change the price after it. So we were making like something like 90 cents for every shirt we sold. You had to drive it to the post office, so. And I, I lived in Greenpoint, and the Greenpoint post office, it's, if you ever want to make yourself laugh, 
read the Yelp reviews for the Greenpoint Post Office. <laughs> It's the funniest thing in the fucking world. It's one of the worst post offices on planet Earth. And you'll read Yelp reviews from people who are like, I stood online for over 90 minutes. And when I got up there, the woman closed the thing in my face, put up the next line sign, smiled. And then when I turned around, the asshole behind me wouldn't let me back online. Like, it's all shit like that. It's yeah. like the best. It, and like I'd show up there with like 50 envelopes with t-shirts in them. And people online would see me with 50 envelopes and be like, because they just knew I was going to ruin everyone's day. <laughs> and they all had my house address on them. Um, I stopped doing answered that a lot because of these of Hallie. That what? was when I stopped putting my return address on stuff. Because I really did. This is how crazy I was. Because you didn't want your wife murdered? Yeah. That's 100%. Good. I was like, it really was. Like, artistically, if one of my fans murders me, I think that's interesting. <laughs> I think that would be interesting if it interesting. built Interesting. Yeah. Just if, interesting. But I don't want them fucking with my wife. No, no, no. So I started using a different address then. Um, oh, we're getting the wrap-up entrance. Yeah. Now we know. We were going to do a bit where she handed us a card and it said wrap it up, but now we just know. Yeah. Uh, so we do need to wrap it up. Going through the questions, seeing we what answered. Out we actually answer, uh, answered most of these. I hope this was mildly interesting for people, and thank you guys for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. Very uh, yeah, you should catch the show if you've never seen it, sir, on uh, <laughs> YouTube. YouTube. It's just easier to go to YouTube yeah. than to explain how to find the show. Yeah. Go to Hopefully YouTube, the Chris Gethard Show. And thank you guys all for supporting us because it really is just the vocal nature of our fans that has kept the show alive over and over again based on me not ending it and based on a network allowing it to give more chances. It's because of you guys um, being so vocal. So thank you. And thank you, Shannon, because Shannon O'Neill, I never, ever forget, there's three people who were at the very first Gethard show. It's you, Bill Florio, and Johnny. Bill and Johnny from the band. At the UCB Theater. Very, very, very first one. Yeah. You're the only one. You never bailed. You never bailed. And other people bailed. And they're still good friends. I've missed shows, but I've not missed bailed shows. on the show. Yeah, and yeah. you've been one of the people who there's been a couple times where you've been like, hey, this is still fun. Why would we fucking stop doing it? There's yeah. a couple times where you've given me that pep talk. Yeah. After, after Comedy Central passed on our pilot, you were one of the people where I was like, I can't keep making you do this or asking you to do this. And you were like, make me. Like, it's fun. We have fun. Yeah. I just show up Shut and up. I get paid now. <laughs> <laughs> it is it's pretty, pretty, sweet pretty gig. easy gig. Yeah, yeah, sweet gig for you very, guys. very easy. Yeah, at this point, yeah. Yeah, but it means so much. You stuck by me more than most have in my life. You're welcome, Christopher. <laughs> Thank you. Now for I think you're mad at me. me again. I'm not mad at you. I always think you're mad at me. I no, I don't let myself get mad at people anymore. Anyway. Yeah. Not people I care about. Aw. <laughs> It's not worth it. Yeah. yeah. And they we get both, mad. We both Everyone has that. flaws. Everyone gets stupid. So you just have to be like, ah, they're being stupid today. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you're not physically harming me or doing hurtful things. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Cool. That's a friendship as long as you don't physically harm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But honestly, them. thank you guys yeah, so much for coming you. up here. So cool of you. Thanks so much. Thanks. <laughs>